Hello and welcome to the Gothic Color channel. In this video I use my wolf heads design to make a 50 style shirt using 2 meters of printed crepe de chine and an extra meter and a half of striped linen. Information on my design and where it can be purchased can be found in the description box of this video. Also in the description box below I have links to the different sections of the video so you can easily skip to the section you are most interested in. Firstly, I'd like to point out that this is my first attempt at making a shirt, so this video is not a tutorial. However, I hope it can work as a bit of an inspiration to trying out something new, and I will be sharing my thoughts and what I learned as I go along. Other than the fabrics I have mentioned and matching threads, other items I used for making this shirt were Wash away quilt as tape 14 mm a half an inch buttons, Microtex needles size 60, a walking foot, a buttonhole foot, as well as a couple of other standard sewing machine feet, depending on what I needed done. So I had bought the wolf heads design on crepe from Spoonflower a few years ago for a different project, which in the end I decided not to do. And also, a while back, I had bought a vintage simplicity pattern from 1955, number 1225, for a shirt which I thought looked nice, and I finally decided to take the plunge and use the crepe to make this shirt. As the design on the crepe is directional, which means you have to cut your pattern taking into account the direction of the design, I realized that I did not have enough of it for this shirt mainly because I had set my heart to making it with the long sleeves which need more fabric. So I decided to combine the crepe with a lightweight linen. First I had to make a couple of mock-ups of the bodice, as the pattern I bought was a smaller size than I am, so I had to adjust the size, but also, because the shirt follows the silhouette of the body, I needed to adjust all the darts to fit my particular shape. I then had the fine idea to make a few modifications, some of which caused me some trouble later on, as you will see. Regarding the darts of the shirt, the biggest change I made was to the back darts. The darts given in the pattern let the bag sag a bit, which I couldn't tell whether it was part of the shirt design or whether I needed to adjust the sizing of the back piece. At any rate, I liked the idea of having a more fitted bag, so I decided to extend the darts and make them into contour darts. So, after washing and pressing, with a bit of starch to improve the stability of my fabrics, I went ahead and cut the pieces of the shirt. I stay stitched them around the seam allowances to stop them from moving out of shape. From the linen I cut, the collar facing, the sleeve cuffs which I cut in a simpler shape than that given in the shirt pattern, the front facings, which in the shirt pattern are part of the front pieces but I separated them, and the back. I also cut a strip on the bias, which you'll see later on. From the crepe I cut the top of the collar in two pieces so that the design sat how I wanted it to, the sleeves, which I adjusted to be fuller than what was given on the pattern, and the front pieces. And here comes my first mistake. When it came to the front pieces, I did not think about the positioning of the fabric design as I should have done. I matched the fabric where it was cut without thinking about where the pattern would fall after the ends were sewn up and the pieces overlapped for the front closure. To mask that mistake, I decided to cut two more strips from the linen to create a contrasting button placket. Here you can see all the layers of fabric for the body of the shirt, starting with the contrast plackets on the front pieces, the facings, then over the collar seams goes a piece of bias tape, the linen bias strip that I mentioned earlier, and finally the back piece. So the first things I sewed together were the top collar pieces, so I could press some interfacing on them. I pressed the seam flat and then I pressed the collar pieces with a piece of interfacing, cut to the shape of the whole collar, making sure that the sides were not going over the edge of the fabric. You can see that I placed a piece of cotton fabric over the top to avoid any of the interfacing adhesive from sticking onto my ironing plate. I did the same thing with the collar facing piece, also putting some interfacing on it. I made sure these pieces cooled down before moving them in order to make sure that the interfacing was properly adhered. 
I also pressed in the edges of the bias tape that I cut from my linen fabric for the back of the neckline. Here you can see the adjustments I made on the back darts on the trial piece that I made from some plain fabric I have for such use. You can see that I made them into contour darts, as I mentioned earlier, to create a better shape for my back. The black lines you can see are where I tidied up the darts before transferring them onto my linen piece. After transferring the darts, I pasted them in order to make sure that they did not shift around during sewing. The linen fabric was very fine and had the tendency to slip around a lot, so basting was a good option to prevent this. Here you can see me actually sewing up the darts at the back of the neck, and then moving on to the darts at the waist, starting off in the middle of the contour darts going up to the top, before turning the fabric around and starting again from the middle of each contour dart to work towards the bottom, thus making sure that I always ended at the point of the dart. Here I'm showing the size adjustments that I made on one of my front pieces. As I have a bit of a belly, I had to adjust the darts on the front and I also had to change the bust dart to fit my shape. Here you can see the darts after basting. Again, the crepe was also quite a slippery fabric, so I made sure that I basted the fabric before sewing it up. Here you can see me sewing up the bust darts a second time. This is something that I had to do a couple of times despite having made mock-ups of the shirt. I had to unpick my stitching and redo them a couple of times on the actual final piece. Once I sewed up all the darts and removed the basting, I pressed the darts down in the direction that was indicated in my pattern. Then I moved on to joining the front pieces and the back piece, starting with the shoulder seams. That was again something that I had to do a couple of times before I was happy with the shape of the seams. If I were to do this again, I would definitely have used my wash away tape to stabilize the sections that needed to be stitched together. Then I carried on with sewing up the sides. If I remember correctly, I managed to do those okay, thank goodness. Then I finished off the seam allowances. I did that with one of my zigzag stitches before I trimmed the excess off the seam allowances because both fabrics I used, the linen and the crepe, were so fine that even with the starch giving them a bit of stability, they bunched up whenever I stitched too close to the edges. So it was easier to do the zigzag stitch on the seam allowances away from the edges and then cut off the excess fabric, making sure that I didn't cut into my stitching. Dealing with the facings of the front, I had the pieces hemmed using a narrow hem sewing machine foot around the edges that were going to be loose under the front of the shirt. Then I attached each facing and button placard piece to the correct front piece. I actually realized later that I should not have done this at this point, but at any rate, here I am top stitching along the edge and along the other side of a front placard. You will see me realizing my mistake in a moment. I then moved on to pinning the collar pieces together, having the right sides of the fabric together. Once I was happy with the pinning, I moved on to sewing the pieces up, doing the sides and the edge of the collar, but leaving the inside of the collar unstitched. Then I trimmed the seam allowances and tidied up the corners, before turning the collar the right way out. Next, I pressed the collar so that it had a nice crisp finish before moving on to top stitching it. I then moved on to trying to figure out how to attach the collar to the bodice and that's when I realized that I had prematurely sewn the plackets and the facings onto the front pieces. Basically, even though I had read the instructions before starting the project, it had somehow stuck in my head that the raw edges of the neckline were meant to go into the open end of the collar before being top stitched into place. That's not how the instructions went, however. So yes, here you can see the moment of realization and then I started doing a whole lot of unpicking. In any case, I managed to eventually sort that out, but I still had to redo the collar at the neckline seam a few more times because of this. I basically decided after starting the project that I'd like to make the neckline a little bit more open than what the pattern called for, and I made that adjustment on the bodice after I had already cut out the fabric for the collar. 
so I had to do some trial and error stitching before finding out how much of the inside of the collar I had to cut out in order for it to fit onto the widened neck opening correctly. Retrospectively, I should have made all these decisions and the trials while I was working on my mock-up piece and not on the final garment, but it was a bit of a last-minute decision and, at any rate, you live and you learn. Once I was happy with the positioning of the collar, I basted the seam and was finally able to take it to the sewing machine. I started sewing the collar on at the back of the garment, sewing towards one edge of the collar, before turning it around and starting from the middle again, sewing towards the other end. That helps with making sure the pieces don't shift from their position, making the collar ends asymmetrical. After finishing sewing on the collar, I then basted the facing onto position, at which point, of course, I realized that again, because of the adjustment I made on the neckline after cutting the fabric, the facing was not cut in the correct shape. But by that point I was getting very annoyed with myself and the whole project, and I decided to carry on with the facing as it was, adjusting its edge at the neck by lying the shirt flat and shifting the facing into a position where it could sit nicely against the outer fabric before basting it at the collar seam. This had the knock-on effect of the seams between the facing and the bias strip, which were meant to fall parallel to the shoulder seams, ending up further to the front of the shirt. Given that any bulk caused by this seam would be covered by the collar, I took the decision to just go ahead and sew it up as it was. I went very slowly and carefully over the stitching I had already made, making sure I was catching the facing and the bias tape to the collar and the bodice. And then, once I trimmed the seam allowance from the facing, I turned the front the right way out. I then decided to do some top stitching around the facing and bias tape, which was not mentioned in the shirt pattern instructions, but given all the adjustments I had made, things were not quite sitting willingly at the correct position, and the top stitching helped with that. And after slip stitching the loose ends of the bias tape onto the main fabric, I finally moved on to dealing with the sleeves. The first thing to do with the sleeves was to stay stitch the seam allowance of the sleeve opening in order to secure the fabric before cutting and sewing on a continuous lap. I sewed on some of my bias tape onto the opening, I had some extra length on my bias tape for this purpose, as you can see here. Then I folded it to cover the raw edge of the sleeve opening before sewing it closed and making a small diagonal stitch across the fold so that the continuous lap would fold nicely at the opening. If you would like to know how to deal with a continuous lap, I have linked in the description box below a couple of useful tutorials I found on YouTube. Next, I sewed up the cuffs. As I said, I made the cuffs much simpler than what the shirt pattern was showing. They were just a standard rectangle which I measured to fit around my wrist. I interfaced the pieces, just as I did with a collar, to give them a crisp finish and folded them in half, right sides together, with a seam allowance of the end that was to attach to the sleeve, folded over on one of the sides. After sewing up the sides, I trimmed the seam allowance and turned the cuffs right side out, pressed them into shape and put them aside while I worked on the actual sleeves. So, after learning from my problems with the seams on the bodice of the shirt, I decided to just go straight into using my wash away tape to stabilize the fabric on the sides of the sleeves where I needed to sew them closed. So, I laid the fabric nice and flat and placed the tape on the seam line, removed the backing and carefully placed the other side of the sleeve on top. Here you can see me sewing the sleeve up. I also used a walking foot just to make sure that everything fed through the sewing machine nice and smoothly. Next, I added some running stitches on the edges of the sleeves in order to gather the fabric so that it fitted into the cuffs. As I mentioned at the beginning, I made the sleeves a bit wider than the pattern because I wanted them to be a bit fuller. Here you can see me gathering the running stitch and adjusting and spacing the gathers as nicely as I could before pinning the fabric onto the open edge of the cuff. Here I am attaching the cuff to the sleeve. 
Then I turned the cuff over and top stitched all around including over the edge over the gathers so that the gathers were enclosed into the cuff. Next I tried to figure out how to work the buttonhole foot for the sewing machine as I had never used it before. With the help of my sewing machine instruction booklet I eventually worked out where the button is meant to go and I fitted the foot onto my sewing machine. I took some pieces of linen and crepe from my offcuts and folded them together to create a similar fabric um, sandwich as that on the front of my shirt in order to experiment with the tension I needed as well as with the buttonholes and their size. Of course, the sewing machine itself determines how large the buttonhole needs to be depending on the size of the button, but I needed to know how big those buttonholes were going to be in order to calculate where I needed to position them on the shirt. Once I had worked that out, I marked the positioning on the front placard. Some shirts have the buttonhole set vertically, but I decided to make them horizontal, and when I looked at the shirt pattern instructions, it seemed to suggest the same thing as you can see in this sketch here. By the way, ignore the fact that the sketch shows breast pockets. I did not want any for my shirt, so that's why I don't mention them. I like the buttonhole stitching to look fairly substantial and I find that sometimes buttonholes made on a sewing machine look kind of threadbare. So after finishing each buttonhole and without moving the fabric from its position, I reset the buttonhole setting on my sewing machine and run the program through a second time, basically sewing the same buttonhole stitching twice. I felt that made the buttonholes look much sharper and neater. That probably would not have been necessary if I was using thick thread for this, but because of the fine fabrics I was using, I was also using a particularly fine thread too. I was very happy with how the buttonhole stitching turned out doing that, so I do recommend sewing them twice, especially if you're using fine thread. I did the buttonholes on the cuffs in the same way. Once I finished making these, I had to cut them open. I used pins on the end of each buttonhole to make sure that my seam reaper didn't accidentally cut through more than it should. After I cut each buttonhole open, I also used my scissors and very carefully cut off any threads jutting out from the fabric, tidying up the edges. I then pinned the shirt closed in order to make sure that the buttonhole and the button placards were both in exactly the same line and exactly the right position, before using pins to mark where the buttons needed to be sewed on. Once I finished, I removed the pins that were keeping the placards together, and here you can see the pins marking the position where I needed to sew on my buttons. So yes, next I sewed on my buttons, and the reason why I did this at this point was because I wanted to be able to wear the shirt properly before marking my hem, because I knew that with the alterations I had made on the shirt I would need to adjust the hem too. So after I tried on the shirt and found where I wanted the hem to be, I basted and sewed it down. Then it was time to attach the sleeves to the body. Now, I don't have footage of this, I'm afraid, but I did a running stitch around the top section of each sleeve and gathered the seam allowance slightly in, in order to help with the easing of the sleeve into the armhole opening, as per the pattern instructions. I pinned the seam of the sleeve and that of the body together, and then I pinned at the top where I had a marking transferred from the shirt pattern. I continued pinning around, easing the sleeve into the armhole. The truth is that I had to do this a number of times because when I tried the shirt on to see whether I had positioned the sleeves properly, I found I had to make some alterations. This was because apart from the neckline, I had also changed the opening of the armholes in order for the body of the shirt to fit properly on my body shape. This of course needed to be done for a decent fit, but annoyingly I had yet again made this change after I had cut out the pieces of fabric without having experimented enough with my mock-up. Anyway, it all amounted to having to fiddle a lot with the arm positioning before being able to sew everything up properly. I have to say that it is because of all these alterations that I made on the pattern that I titled this video as a 50s style shirt. Because I did use an original 50s pattern, but as I made quite a few changes, I wasn't sure whether it would be really valid saying that the final shirt I ended up with was of the original pattern. I mean, obviously, I had to change things in order to make the shirt fit me, but I also had a few stylistic alterations as well. 
Anyway, I worked on this shirt for a total of about six months, so it was quite a lengthy process, though I was working on a couple of other things at the same time, but I finally did manage to finish my first attempt at making a shirt, and you can see it here after washing, drying and ironing. From the drawings given on the shirt pattern envelope, you can see that the shirt is meant to be worn under a skirt or trousers with a belt, and, well, on someone 10 or 20 years younger than me, this would probably look cutely vintage, but on my middle-aged physique it looks rather frumpy. It doesn't help that I wore an 80s belt for this. Anyway, I'll leave the true vintage look to the young'uns and wear my shirt in a more casual way. A couple of things I noted after finishing were, firstly, that despite being very precise with placing and sewing, my buttonhole placard looks a bit wobbly after washing, and despite ironing it as well as I could. So I would recommend using some light interfacing when using fine linen for this sort of thing. Secondly, after washing and drying, it looks like the hem needs some adjustment, especially at the front. So I'll work on that at some point, but I need to take a break from working on the shirt for a bit. I do hope you enjoyed this video, even though it was a bit all over the place. I think it is important to remember that when sewing, you will often need to undo what you have done and do it again, and sometimes a number of times. So, if you're a beginner at sewing, don't get disheartened by any mistakes, it is all part of the learning process. I have a number of ideas for my next few videos. I'm thinking of doing some simpler sewing projects, such as a scarf, so focusing on ways to finish the edges, and some craft-related projects for the home, such as pillowcases or something similar, we'll see. If you're interested in seeing more videos for sewing inspiration, why not subscribe to my channel? Also, I would appreciate it if you press the like button and or leave a comment down below as that helps with the YouTube algorithm and the visibility of the channel. Thank you and see you next time. Goodbye!